27th Annual Graduate Research Conference at UMBC. Each, exactly, 37 years. That's uh, older than a lot of us are in this room. <laughs> Each year, the Graduate Student Association and the Office of Graduate Student Life invite graduate students at any stage of their research to share their work with the UMBC community. This year, more than 140 graduate students answered this call, the most ever. So I think that's another round of applause right there. Presenters span the disciplines and represent the natural sciences, engineering, technology, math, the social sciences, the arts, and the humanities. If you want to learn about Sentence Shaper, Repolitics, Facebook, and UMBC's Student Success Network, GRC is the place for you. This conference would not have been possible without the dedicated work of the conference planning committee, valuable input from the GSA executive board, the GSA senate, and the office of graduate student life. Guidance from the graduate school, faculty and staff reviewers, and wonderful partnerships with numerous offices on campus, especially the Career Center and the Alex Brown Center for Entrepreneurship that have for the first year offered three career workshops for graduate students at this conference. We hope that you enjoyed the presentations and workshops this morning, and there is more to come this afternoon. We are thrilled to have you with us, and now please join me in welcoming Dr. Rudlich, the Dean of the Graduate School. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. This has been a really wonderful morning, hasn't it? Yes? How many of you have presented this morning? And then some of you are still to present this afternoon? No? How many of you attended one of the professional development sessions? Yeah, that's something that's new this year. We're really quite proud of it. So. Uh, it is my pleasure to officially welcome each of you to the 37th annual UMBC Graduate Research Conference. Um, the purpose of the GRC is to provide UMBC graduate students the opportunity to present their research in an interdisciplinary setting to peers, faculty members, and the UMBC community. The conference is a critical event that adds to the academic richness of the entire university. Our first class faculty and graduate students are well reflected in today's proceedings. Thank you, faculty colleagues, for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here today for your graduate students. Let's give all the faculty reviewers a round of applause. And let's give a round of applause to all the non-faculty reviewers as well. The Graduate Research Conference has become a long-standing tradition at UMBC. When we discontinued the joint GRC with the University of Maryland Baltimore, we kept the numbering system, and that's what brings us to 37 years. What makes the GRC so special is that it is done by the GSA and graduate students. This undertaking is no small effort. Hundreds, if not thousands, of hours have gone into the conference planning. This is a team effort, and the GSA Executive Board and Office of Graduate Student Life spearhead the effort. Special recognition goes to Romy Hubler, who is a doctoral candidate in language literacy and culture. <laughs> Romy serves as the GSA Vice President and the GRC Chair. And I want to tell you, Romy is the master of time management. Many of you may not know that last week she turned in her dissertation to her committee. So in the midst of all of this planning, she got that done as well. Uh, also on the committee is Tahir Ahmadi, who is a doctoral candidate in human services psychology in the area of community and applied social psychology. 
Eva Piera Escriva, master student in the Intercultural Communications Program. Tennille Wells Brown, master student in Economic Policy Analysis. Jennifer Mayo, master student in Geography and Environmental Systems. And Antia DeShields, doctoral candidate in LLC. Please join me in congratulating all of them on a wonderful job um, and, and uh, for the entire team. The Council of Graduate Schools, which is the professional society for graduate deans, and ETS, those are, that's the Educational Testing Service, the folks who run the GRE and the TOEFL programs, commissioned a group of corporate and university leaders to examine what we are currently doing and what we should be doing to guide graduate students toward their career goals. UMBC President Freeman Rabowski was a member of this commission, and they produced a report called Pathways Through Graduate School and Into Careers. GSA has been an integral part of the conversation and planning on how UMBC will address the findings and recommendations in the report. I'm very proud of the responses that we've gotten from across the campus, and in fact, the professional development workshops being offered here today by the Career Center and the Alex Brown Center for Entrepreneurship are a great example of the activities resulting from the partnerships that have formed at UMBC to address the recommendations in this report. You'll be hearing much more about that in the coming years. Several of your departments have been planning uh, activities to bring back alumni and do networking um, with employers in your disciplines. Um, and so I think that, that there'll be a lot more happening, and so stay tuned. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Carl Steiner, who is UMBC's Vice President for Research and is a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. In the short time that he has been at UMBC, he has made a tremendous impact, including helping to guide the process of securing the federally funded Research and Development Center in Cybersecurity with the MITRE Corporation and the University of Maryland College Park. Uh, and so I welcome Dr. Steiner. Good afternoon. Well, this is the third time we tried this, so we're going to try it one more time. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. See, now that's what I expect from a UMBC crowd. So, uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Rutledge, and, and, and danke schön, Romy. So, from one German to the other, we, we can do that. Um, it's my honor, and I'm actually not the listed speaker, as you may see if you look in the program. I'm, I'm here, really here, uh, and it's my honor to bring you greetings and, and wishes from our provost, from Dr. Philip Rouse, who is at this moment boarding a plane to represent UMBC outside of Maryland. So. Uh, I am not the provost, but I play one at the Graduate Research Conference. <laughs> um, and I want to share some thoughts with you about the importance and the value of graduate research here at UMBC. Uh, in my role as the Vice President for Research, I act as the Chief Research Advocate for the entire institution. And it's my responsibility to foster scientific research and scholarship and creative achievement uh, across the campus and provide strategic guidance and institutional support to our faculty and all of you, the students who work with those faculty on very important research topics. And I can tell you, I'm really thrilled to see that many of you here today. 37 years, that's, that's quite, quite a streak, and I do realize that 90% of you were not alive when this program started because you're all graduate students, so probably younger than 30 years, seven years old. All of you here at UMBC are active participants in the wide-ranging aspects of research, and it goes from the formulation of the hypothesis early on to the selection of the methods that you use to prove or disprove the hypothesis, the investigation, the analysis, the discovery process, the creation, and, and also to the dissemination of your progress. And this is today is one of those parts uh, which, which falls under the dissemination phase. When your research and your scholarship and your creative work is shared with peers across the academic community. So I'm here in sort of a dual role. As VP for research, I'm here to celebrate those intellectual accomplishments of each and every one of you. Uh, but I'm also seeing myself as a lifelong student, and I really uh, look forward to learning and seeing more of your accomplishments in a very wide variety of fields, from engineering to intercultural communications, from statistics to sociology. 
and from cell biology to atmospheric physics. And I had a chance to look through the program and, and I picked up a couple of the, the topics in there and I just want to give you a flavor. Some of them have spoken already, some will speak this afternoon. But the breadth of the research topics are really amazing. Right? Some of them cover life sciences, an area that I, that I had some personal experience before I came to UMBC, such as DNA fragmentation by microwave focusing on bacterial infections uh, for, by, by Johan Melendez. Um, we're looking at integrating real-world scenarios into laparoscopic cholecystectomy skills training to make sure that the future surgeons have ways to, to train online by Chris Wong and Human Centered Computing. And we're also looking at topics like antibacterial pharmaceuticals that are present in poultry litter uh, by Kiramanji uh, Mangalgiri in environmental engineering. And that's interesting because some of these topics do cross over uh, between different uh, key focal areas. Some of the work represented today represents literally the entire human lifespan from newborns and actually preemies to senior citizens. We have some work that looks at support needs of mothers of infants requiring NICU care. That's the neonatal intensive care unit. And that's Rose Belanger in, uh, Belanger in Applied Developmental Psychology. Then we have uh, a work looking at parental adherence in toddler obesity prevention. That's the next stage of life that Cherise Johnson in public policy is looking at. And then we look to the back end of, of life and drug use and well-being at and beyond midlife towards the uh, senior citizens, and Kristen Smith in gerontology is the student that's working on that. And then finally, we have others that explore opportunities to create a more environmental sustainable world. We are looking at Doppler wind li LIDAR, essentially a radar system to assess uh, features of offshore wind power generation, Alexandre saint pay in, in geography and environmental system. Uh, we have uh, Tan Michael Carney in electric engineering looking at palladium wires for biofuel cells. Uh, Sadi Habib in mechanical engineering is looking at magnesium alloys for, for body and powertrain applications. And then we also look at such ways of, of saving energy um, like simulation to evaluate intelligent traffic control algorithms so that we don't all have to stand for two hours on I-95, I suppose, by John Panic in systems engineering. Romy already covered the last project I have uh, because it has a very interesting title. I'm really looking forward to learn more about this. That's Rapalytics, when data science meets rap. And Abai Kashyap in computer science is working on that topic. So you have a very diverse group of students, a very diverse group of, of projects here today. And I really encourage all of you to not just look at the five peers that you already have studied with, but to look beyond it. I know you're doing this. You learn so much sometimes by just going beyond your comfort level. And, and getting to know some of the other work that, that colleagues you may have not met before today are working on. And all of a sudden, the light bulb goes on and something that you didn't expect may happen. It's in that intersection between different fields. So all these fields are different by themselves. They're all value, but they have certain similarities. Each field requires its own research methods and questions. In each case, you as the researchers uh, are trying to learn, build, or accomplish something that nobody else has an answer to yet, because that's why it's research. And when you're, whether your work is artistic, sociological, or scientific in nature, you become immersed in the problem or issue, learning everything you can about its past, its present, and devising new ways to move forward. So as all of you know, every single one of you is addressing questions today that may, may well present solutions and answers that we will need tomorrow. And looking at tomorrow, after today's event, I'm sure many of you will be back in your labs, in your studios, and in your offices to go back at the problem you may learn some, some things today based on questions from the reviewers and, and from some of your peers. And based on that feedback, uh, you will go back in the lab with, with new ideas and, and new vigor. So at the end of the day, uh, I suggest that the experiences that you have today by sharing your information with so many people uh, and, and, and putting it in a way that, that makes it understandable to people who are not experts like you are in your field, uh, will make you stronger scientists. And as I always say, you may be the most brilliant scientist, but if nobody knows or understands what you're doing, you may lose half your potential. So this dissemination phase, this, phase, this, this presentation opportunity that the Graduate Research Association is putting together is incredibly valuable for all of you. So if we manage today, in whatever capacity you're attending this event today, be it as, as students, as presenters, as attendees, as mentors, as panel members, Maybe you have some parents or friends in the room. If you leave here changed as a thinker in the ways that I believe you will, then I think all of, have, all of us have met our goals 
that we set for today. So I want to thank you and congratulate you for participating, and I would be remiss to not thank Romy and the entire uh, Graduate Research Association for organizing this day and making a spectacular event. So thank you very much for being here, and uh, I think phase two of the day is beginning right after me. I think we're going to get going with it. So thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Hi, my name is Rachel Carter, and I'm a PhD candidate in the Language Literacy and Culture Program, which is an interdisciplinary program here on campus. And I, it is my pleasure to moderate this panel on interdisciplinary collaboration. I know this was something that many of you requested that you wanted to talk about, and we're very happy to have um, three members of our community here. And we have Dr. Lee Blaney, Dr. Michelle Stefano, and Dr. Judah Ranch. And we're going to take just a minute to let each of them tell you who they are. And we'll just do a brief introduction, and then we'll start out on the first question. OK, Dr. Blaney, would you like to go first? Sure. Thank you. Can everyone hear me OK? Great. Well, I'm Lee Blaney. I'm an assistant professor in chemical, biochemical, and environmental engineering, which I think is one of the longer department names on campus. And it's always mm -hmm. kind of a mouthful. Um, I'm an environmental engineer by training, and this is my fourth year here at UMBC. I'm uh, Michelle Stefano. I'm uh, on campus. My position is highly collaborative in its very nature. I work for two uh, places. I'm sorry. I am a visiting assistant professor in American Studies, but I'm also leading a partnership between the American Studies Department and UMBC in general and the Maryland State a uh, folk life program which is called Maryland Tradition. So I come out of uh, anthropology and also <coughs> looking at this idea of heritage studies. Hi, I'm Judah Runch. I'm Dean of the Erickson School and Professor. Uh, I am a dinosaur. I was, um, I, I got a doctorate <laughs> in an interdisciplinary program beginning in 1966. Oh, wow. And uh, it changed the way I looked at everything I did from then on and I can't look at it any other way. Uh, I, I'm trained as a psychologist, in fact, and as a clinical psychologist and, and geriatrician. Well, that's wonderful. So you were right there at the beginning, of the sort of interdisciplinary work um, from, from the beginning of your career. Right, and I had no idea what was happening to me. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Thank you all very much. Um, I wanted to also mention that I, along with our, our friend Dr. Steiner, who is speaking ahead of us, um, we have been working on, and Dr. Freeland, and we may have some other people here as well, who have been working on the Provost Task Force on Interdisciplinary Activities. And uh, so that has been um, a very interesting experience. And one of the things that Dr. Um, Steiner, I think, addressed this at the beginning, <coughs> at, at the end of his speech, when he was talking about, you know, this idea of moving outside of your comfort zone, getting to know people who are doing things from a very different perspective, and how that can help us look at our work in a new way. And I think each of our panelists will be speaking to that. Um, and that's certainly one of the things during the task force that we've been talking a lot about. Also, just the fact that many people define interdisciplinary work in a very different way. So I thought the very first thing that we could do is if each of you will take a couple of minutes to describe maybe a project that you're working on and why you consider it to be interdisciplinary. So Dr. Blaney, if you'd like to begin. Sure. So I always like to be interactive, and I know we're not set up for too much interaction in this room right now. Um, but do I have anyone in the audience from Ohio? Okay, a couple of people. Sorry if I did that. Um, 
<laughs> so what happened in Ohio last summer that was big in the news? Can my two people back there, does anyone remember? Just scream it out, that's fine. Algal blooms, thank you. <laughs> so we already are seeing the benefits of this morning's presentations, I think. Um, last summer in Lake Erie, and especially around Toledo, Ohio, there is large algal blooms in Lake Erie, which serves as the drinking water source for Toledo. And there's about 400,000 people that drink water from that plant. With the algal blooms, there is these toxins called cyano cyanotoxins that got into the drinking water intake and basically meant that that drinking water was not safe for consumption. Mm -hmm. So we have 400,000 people that can't use their drinking water. Sound like a big deal? Sound like an interdisciplinary problem? Definitely is. So <clears throat> right now in my lab, we're working on those issues, mostly related to the Chesapeake Bay watershed and Maryland. Where the whole Lake Erie thing got started is all the agricultural area that we see in the Midwest, there's a lot of nutrients that drain off of that agricultural land. And when I say nutrients, I'm mainly talking about nitrogen and phosphorus. So one of the things that we thought was, we know nitrogen and phosphorus are getting into our surface waters they're causing problems. So they cause this thing called eutrophication, which is a big long word. Basically it just means that the dissolved oxygen present in water bodies drops, which kills off the fish and other things that live in the water. It can also lead to these harmful algal blooms, which can you know, um, cause problems for our drinking water quality. <clears throat> so what we're doing is we're working with farmers to say, can we recover some of these nutrients from animal waste products before they get applied on fields and before they get into surface waters. So what we actually do, and you know, you're probably gonna laugh and I apologize for talking about this while you're eating lunch, but we get buckets and buckets of chicken poop into my lab. And we take that chicken poop and we try to extract out the phosphorus. So now we're separating this waste product and we're generating a new product that we can apply in a more responsible manner to make sure that we're not discharging nutrients out into places like Lake Erie and the Chesapeake Bay where they can cause environmental and human problems. So I'll spare you the details of the science and the technology and kind of really just hone in on the interdisciplinary aspects because there's a lot in this kind of project. First, we're dealing with agriculture. You know, chicken poop, we get lots of it. Some of the farmers that we work with have houses where they um, grow hundreds of thousands of birds each year. One of the farmers that we're expecting a shipment in from um, in the next couple of days he generates 200,000 tons of chicken poop each year. Okay, so 200,000 tons, that fills this room several times over. We're not getting that much into my lab, um, <laughs> but we get a small subset. Okay, so there's this agricultural waste issue. That turns directly into a legislative issue and a regulatory issue because nutrient pollution is a very big deal for the reasons I mentioned and a couple of other reasons. <clears throat> and that's on both sides. It's on managing the waste as well as future regulations which are going to limit the concentrations or the loads of nitrogen and phosphorus that get into our rivers and lakes. And that's happening right now, especially in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Very strict regulations that are causing big headaches for people in environmental engineering in terms of what's coming out of wastewater treatment plants, as well as farmers because right now they have a waste product and there's nothing that they can do with it. Economics. If these things are gonna be regulated in the future, that means there's gonna be fines associated with not abiding by those regulations. So if we're able to reduce the amount of phosphorus present in this waste product, you know, that's one thing, it's gonna prevent farmers from being you know, fined um, for, uh, um, for going beyond those regulations, but also it's generating a product that they can then sell. Okay, so we're kind of limiting fines and we're also generating a resource that can be sold and generate income for farmers. <coughs> On the environmental side, like I mentioned, um, there's a lot of aspects. And then finally, the economics. So we're removing those fines, we're generating new products, but we're also creating jobs. And we're creating green jobs that are gonna help the environment and help ensure our um, water resources. Another thing that I didn't mention is the fact um, that phosphorus especially is a very valuable commodity. Right now, phosphorus around the world mainly comes from three countries the U.S., Morocco, and China. China mainly uses their phosphorus for their own purposes. The U.S. supply is dwindling. So all of our phosphorus is really coming from one place. That is you know, a very big economic um, you know, factor because if they start generating, if they start bumping up the cost of phosphorus, 
then that's going to cause severe um, consequences around the world, especially as our population continues to increase and we need to generate more food. We need phosphorus to build crops, to grow crops. And so really right now it's, um, it's a very important issue. And so I think this project, dealing with our chicken poop, trying to provide safe drinking water, trying to ensure food and economic security, and generating new jobs is very much interdisciplinary. And I would also call it sustainable. We think of sustainability in my lab and environmental engineering in general as projects um, or work that can benefit people, the planet, and generate profit. And with this job or with this project, we're definitely doing that. And so that would be my example um, of an interdisciplinary and sustainable project. Thank you, Dr. Bellini. That was wonderful. Dr. Stephanie. Thank you. <laughs> So I'm going to speak about a project that's been ongoing since late 2012. So we have a couple people here from Ohio. Anyone from or familiar with Dundalk? All right. <laughs> a bunch more. <coughs> How about the Sparrows Point Steel Mill? Mm. Anyone know of someone who worked there, a family member? OK, there, there's always a couple, no matter where you are, especially in this region. So uh, the project I'm talking about is Mill Stories. You can visit it online, www.millstories.org. And it looks at the closure of the Sparrows Point Steel Mill. It's um, um, one of the, it was at its peak after World War II, one of the largest steel mills in the world. Uh, steel was produced for the Empire State Building, uh, Golden Gate Bridge, Bay Bridge, you name it. Um, it's been going and, and it ended, it closed in 2012, but it had a, a, over 125 year life. It was um, for the majority of its life owned by Bethlehem Steel. This is their outfit on the water. Uh, so that coal from Cuba in the late 19th century uh, could be quickly produced into steel of, uh, at a deep water port versus taking it into Pennsylvania. In any case, again, it closed. And this is highly devastating for the Dundalk community and beyond. Uh, in the, its last decade of its life, in the 2000s, there, the, the employment numbers dwindled to about 2,000 steel workers and associated personnel. So the Mill Stories project really looks at this idea of putting a human face on this larger story of deindustrialization, American industrial boom and bust. We often hear in the news about factories closing, manufacturing centers. A lot of statistics are used to describe these, the, the, this phenomenon, which is common increasingly across the world. Nonetheless, what are the sociocultural impacts of deindustrialization, industrial decline, and what is also being used, this term of post-industrialization. And so obviously, economically, there are a lot of devastating uh, impacts in the Dundalk area and beyond. There have also been suicides in the steelworker uh, community because of the loss of jobs, loss of pension, et cetera. So there's many, of obviously, political elements. Nonetheless, I come out of anthropology, and here in the United States, I'm considered a folklorist. So um, with my colleague, Bill Shoebridge, who, who is in the Media and Communication Studies uh, Department, we were looking at capturing, but also safeguarding the significance of the mill, its history, but also its living heritage, or a term that's hot right now in the international scene, intangible cultural heritage. And that is their stories and memories of working there, and the importance in their own perspectives, their voices, of what is important about the steel mill and what needs to be learned and what needs to be kept alive, so to speak. So uh, over two years, we have interviewed over 30 former steel workers, associated personnel, as well as community members in Dundalk, who are, their lives have been shaped by the steel mill. And I must also note that it had a company town up until the early 1970s. So people literally lived in the middle of Sparrows Point Steel Mill. Um, and so their stories and memories can be kept alive at, uh, through uh, th this, this uh, using new media t technologies and by creating digital stories, which you can view and listen uh, to on, on the website, millstories.org. But it's also this idea of not giving voice to the community. They have voices. They're very angry. There's also a lot of happiness about their lives that they were able to uh, develop because of the, the rise of the middle class and labor history and the unions, et cetera. Nonetheless, it, it, this project helps to amplify their voices. And again, really put that human voice on this story that's so common in the media, deindustrialization, uh, you know, industry moving from one place to another on the planet, but what are the impacts and what is the importance of, of learning more about that? So um, yeah, I think that's all I'll say for now. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
great idea, amplifying voices. That's lovely. Dr. Ranch, thank you. Um, first, let me thank you for inviting me. This is my first time um, at, at this event and to be on this stage with these colleagues who are doing really remarkable and fascinating work. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really a great thrill uh, for me, so thank you. Um, how many of you would like to get old? <laughs> Some of you waffling about that? <laughs> you know, there is no other choice other than the bad one. Yeah. Um, how many of you have older relatives? How many of you are thinking about the day you will have to take care of your older relatives? Okay, so let me tell you about um, something that happens to many older people that is decidedly dangerous for them, and that is they go to a hospital emergency room. Um, people over the age of 65 constitute roughly 60 to 65 percent of emergency room admissions in the United States, even though they're 11 percent of the population. And we know, if you've ever been to an emergency room, what an unpleasant experience it is. Uh, if you're old and you may have some confusion uh, and you may have some sensory loss and don't fully understand what's going on, it, it's even worse. And for many older people, entry into an emergency room begins a downward spiral of, of functional dependency, poor health, and ultimately uh, death. So we at the Erickson School were very happy when in 2008 we were asked by Holy Cross Hospital uh, in Silver Spring to develop the first dedicated seniors emergency room in the United States. And uh, we did that. It has, uh, I know there's one satisfied user of, of the room, uh, of the emergency room in, in, with us today. Um, it has since been replicated in 27 other hospitals in the United States. The problem is there are 5,000 hospitals in the United States. And the, the rate of replication is nowhere keeping up with the rate of admissions and as they're growing. So last summer we had a, uh, an opportunity to do a newer version of the Seniors Emergency Department in St. Agnes Hospital right, right down the street. And um, that allowed us to employ really a, a, a thoroughly interdisciplinary approach to both looking at the problem and coming up with creative ways to make the emergency room experience both more responsive mm -hmm. and less dangerous for older people uh, who went in there. Um, so the research piece of this is really the applied practice of this and evaluating what, you know, what happens. Um, so to the point of the nature of, of interdisciplinarity, uh, the, the interdisciplinary nature of geriatrics was, was pointed out first in 1903 and then again in 1916. And basically it became the, the point of orientation for any geriatric medical practice that would be A, respectable, and B, sort of professionally responsible. Um, and in a way, it really brings us to the, to the focus of why the geriatric emergency experience is both so bad and where the opportunity for improvement is. Um, emergency rooms are there to reduce uncertainty. That's all they're there to do. Um, and once you reduce uncertainty and come up with some sort of a, of a diagnosis, you refer the person elsewhere, whether to home or to another part of the hospital. Um, Typically, emergency rooms that are not geriatrically aware treat people in a multidisciplinary way. There is no integration of information. There is no sensitivity to the focus on the person and their family. Uh, it is more about which specialist gets to put their hands on you and decide what it is that, that might be wrong with you. Um, <clears throat> currently, there are 72 places in the United States that claim to do it. Elsewise, the rest of them are not, are not with the program. So let me tell you about some of the disciplines we had to engage in order to come up with this new environment. Uh, forgive me, it's a, it's a bit of a list. Social work, dietetics, pharmacy, medical sociology, uh, storytelling, uh, management, geriatric medicine, language and linguistics, uh, cognitive psychology, social psychology, clinical psychology, um, environmental adaptation and design. And those are just some of the people who worked on the team uh, that, that created this process. And their job was to come up with a brand new way of doing things so that a person could be evaluated in order to eliminate the highest probability causes of their being in the emergency room. Those are, by definition, interdisciplinary concerns. Polypharmacy is one, falls risk is two, depression is three, dementia is four, uh, and abuse is five. And so what we ultimately do is build screens that people could be processed very, very quickly uh, so they could reduce the uncertainty and be sent to the right, uh, to the right places. Um, the 
the, the, the opening of the program has been held up by the Ebola problem. Uh, St. Agnes is not a wealthy hospital and had to devote resources to uh, getting the, the, themselves ready to deal with, the, with the Ebola patients. Uh, it is on schedule to be opened this spring. Um, but I will say that there was a very, very rich opportunity for us to use this interdisciplinary approach uh, intentionally to, to get people to work towards one common goal that was larger than what any single discipline could have done. Thank you, Dr. Raj. Thank you very much. I think one of the things that you said is particularly interesting. You know, there are many different terms, multidisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary, many of which we spend, as Dr. Freeland, Dr. Steiner could tell you, talked a lot about these different terms and the different iterations of interdisciplinarity um, when we were in the task force. But I think one of the things you said was particularly salient, and that is interdisciplinary work requires sort of an integration of these tools and these resources and these methodologies. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that, and I think that was a very useful example for that as well. If I may comment, um, mm -hmm. as I said, I, I was in an interdisciplinary career and doctoral program without really being aware of how the wheels turned, how the process worked. It was not until I came to UMBC, frankly, That's uh, and, and met Steve McAlpine and Steve Freeland uh, that I really was able to get at the way these things can be made to work together in an intentional kind of way so that the synergy was really evident to all the different disciplines who were around the table. So that was the unique contribution of this environment, I think, to the work that we do. That's, I like that word synergy. I think that's also kind of very helpful in helping us understand this concept of interdisciplinarity. Um, thank you very much. So I think particularly because of you know, your discussion about integration and synergy. Let's go next to the question of how you see interdisciplinarity strengthening your own work. So what are, maybe Dr. Blaney, you could speak to a couple of different examples that show how your work is, um, is strengthened by using interdisciplinary tools and methods. Sure. Um, well, I think I'm lucky because I think environmental engineering um, in general is very interdisciplinary. You know, we're a new field. You don't see too many environmental engineering departments around the country, which is why we have our awesome name of chemical, biochemical, and environmental engineering here at UMBC, mm -hmm. which means I get to interact with chemical and biochemical engineers, which I find fascinating and on a daily basis leads to interdisciplinary ideas and, you know, opportunities to collaborate um, with people outside of my field. Um, you know, and I think this is because environmental engineering is pretty new. It really didn't open up until 1970 when the EPA was formed. You know, there was work going on before that, and we used to be called sanitation engineers, which I kind of like. Um, kind of wish we could still be called sanitation engineers. I think it's a little bit, uh, you know, maybe more grimy than environmental. And as I already told you, I work with chicken poop, so the grimier the better. Um, but I think a wastewater treatment plant is you know, a great example of how environmental engineering is dis interdisciplinary. So if you haven't been to a wastewater treatment plant, that's where all the stuff that goes down your drain ultimately ends <coughs> up. And if you're in a wastewater treatment plant, there's chemistry going on, there's biology going on, there's engineering, there's hydraulics. How do you collect wastewater from all around the city? You know, all of that water goes to one plant or, you know, a couple of plants that treat anywhere from in the county, maybe you know, a couple tens of millions of gallons per day in Baltimore City, up to 200 million gallons per day of wastewater gets treated, okay, in one plant. There's a plant in D.C. that's even bigger than that. <clears throat> and so how do you take the chemistry, how do you take the biology, how do you take all these different fields to treat wastewater, discharge it into in the environment in a way that's not going to harm the environment, in a way that's not going to um, then contaminate drinking water supplies that are maybe downstream? These are really big questions. Um, that we like to ask. In terms of how it's strengthened our work, um, and I'll share with you one of our other kind of major research areas. We're interested in how to treat pharmaceuticals that are present in drinking water resources or in wastewater before discharging to the environment. And so we were just talking about hospitals and care um, facilities. So we're interested in those as well because we see large loads of pharmaceuticals coming through the wastewater. So actually, when I interviewed at UMBC, Julie Ross, who's now the dean of the College of Engineering and IT, took me down to UMB in the medical school, and I talked to a couple of people, and they said, 
well, what do you want to do with us? You're an environmental engineer. Why would you want to interact with the hospital? And I said, I want your wastewater. <laughs> <laughs> Take me to your wastewater. And they looked at me like, are you serious? It's like, yeah, we deal with chicken poop in my lab. We also deal with wastewater. We also deal with the stuff called activated sludge. <clears throat> I have the best smelling lab on campus. <laughs> if you don't believe me, come by the third floor of the engineering building and you'll know what lab is mine. Um, <laughs> But so we went down there, I was talking to people and you know, we're thinking about, well, how can we treat pharmaceuticals in these systems? And generally, we use chemical tools, so we try to oxidize these contaminants. We try to change the chemical molecules in our treatment processes. But I felt like that wasn't enough. And that's kind of the traditional approach. If we change the molecule, technically that antibiotic or that chemotherapy agent doesn't exist anymore. Something else exists. So then we started thinking, okay, well, that's the environmental engineering approach. But how can we build on that? How can we be more robust and maybe take better care of the ultimate problem that these contaminants, these new contaminants, or like we call them emerging contaminants, are present in our water and wastewater resources? And so what we do is we go in and we use advanced analytical chemistry tools to figure out, well, what molecules are we actually forming during treatment? Because maybe what we're forming is more toxic and more important than what we're starting with. If I'm treating an antibiotic and I'm forming another antibiotic, maybe I'm not actually making the problem any better. And so we use a lot of advanced analytical chemistry, but then I also had to become a little bit of a pharmacologist, which was very outside of my comfort zone as an environmental engineer. But now, myself and my group, we know pharmacological mechanisms, we know how antibiotics work, we know how other pharmaceuticals work, which allowed us to then go in and say, well, we're treating this water, we know how we're changing the concentration of our contaminant, we know what we're forming, but does it still have pharmacological activity? Does it still have some kind of toxicological activity? And so we wanted to take that on because it would strengthen our ability to actually say whether or not we're treating a water or a wastewater in a way that we're actually removing the ultimate threat and not just treating some concentration or some contaminant in maybe a more superficial way. Those conversations down at the medical school um, and the, the hospital were actually also very enlightening to us in terms of thinking about how these contaminants actually get into our water and wastewater sources. So I was talking with the director of pharmacy um, down at UMB, and I was kind of mentioning, uh, here's what we're interested in, and you know, here's what we're trying to do. And he said, oh, that's, that's great. We never even considered that. If we only give half a dose of you know, some medication, we shoot the other half right down the sink. I said, oh, well, okay, well, you're keeping us in business, but you know, maybe there's an opportunity to actually make this a two-way street, share some of our expertise in terms of how we're thinking about treating these streams, but then also give something back to our partners to say, well, maybe there's also ways to optimize um, the approach kind of higher up the stream. And so you know, there's a large gasp and a large shock when I said that, but I think you know, a lot of you or your relatives or your family members probably at some point have poured old medication or expired medication in the toilet that's going to the same place. And so it's really a two-way street, and I think by having this interdisciplinary approach, it's both strengthened our ability to do research in terms of the science, not just being environmental engineers, but being environmental engineers and analytical chemists and toxicologists or pharmacologists, but also in terms of just getting the word out about how we can prevent this problem to the wider public and the greater public. Um, and I think both of those have been um, very important to our ongoing work and definitely strengthened the research. Thank you, Dr. Blaney. Dr. Stefano. Yeah, sure. I think I'll speak at a more general level. Uh, it sounds like all of our work is focusing on social issues. Mm -hmm. right? So there's a common ground, and also <coughs> it very much has applied components. So uh, I think what interdisciplinarity brings to applied projects such as these, whether it's in chemistry, environmental uh, engineering, or looking at um, healthcare uh, related issues, uh, or uh, deindustrialization here in Baltimore. Um, what we're doing really is we're always trying to approach the truth. It doesn't mean we arrive at the truth, but we try to approach it. And what interdisciplinarity, from, in my perspective, helps to do is you, it's through collaboration that you become more and more multidisciplinary in your project. And that means more and more methodological uh, toolkits are being used and theories at, you know, through which to, um, again, approach the truth, but also complicate the issues you're looking at. We live in a time where everything's bite-sized information, oversimplified, you're either in this camp or that camp on whatever issue, everything's so black and white, yet we all know in our research, no matter if you're in a laboratory or not, how complex issues really are, uh, especially at that social level. 
So uh, just a quick answer, interdisciplinarity for me helps to give us a more holistic understanding of the issues we're looking at. Right, we, again, we get to integrate all sorts of different toolkits. Uh, within the Mill Stories project, I'm working and learning about new technologies to help safeguard these stories, but also amplify the voices of those who need to be heard with respect to deindustrialization, global capitalism, whatever you want to name it, uh, but also to reveal the complexity and to, in a way, push against this oversimplification of issues that are affecting all of us that we hear so uh, often in the mainstream media and uh, news. Thank you. That's wonderful. <clears throat> That's a great mm -hmm. opportunity for me to segue, so thank you. Um, <clears throat> one of the big challenges we have had in, in the aging and mental health world is understanding where care causes excess disability in older people. And it's especially true in the care of people with Alzheimer's disease. And that has really been what I've been doing for the last 40 years, uh, is trying to get practitioners to understand that when they ask the questions that are within the walls of their discipline, they tend to come up with the same answers. But those answers aren't always the right answer to explain the phenomenon you're seeing in the behavior of the older person. So I'll give you a for instance. When I first started, uh, and I'm a geriatric autodidact, I took no coursework in aging, because uh, there was no coursework in aging back in the age of the dinosaurs when I was in school. Um, and I would get asked to see people in nursing homes who, quote, had Alzheimer's disease. And what I would see was they were over-medicated, they were under-stimulated, they had urinary tract infections, on and on and on and on. That was a very radical position in those days because many physicians didn't want to hear that from me. So part of it was really a, a sort of a social action agenda to say, look, if you keep saying, the person has Alzheimer's disease, you've got to manage their behavior by drugs. What the drugs do is two things. It slows them down and causes side effects that typically make them more confused. So you give them more drugs, which, so you get this vicious cycle. So what interdisciplinarity allowed me to do was understand and ultimately explain to people that there's another way to look at this phenomenon. And if you eliminate the excess disability, and this is still our mantra, two things happen. The person has typically a better quality of life, and two, they require less care. And in an institutional environment, that's a very, very important payoff. So that now the research over the last 40 years has begun to, has begun to dig into, besides Alzheimer's disease, what is it that's causing people to be confused? And so the, the beginning of that conversation really started, not, not just by the work I did, but by finding people in other disciplines who were sympathetic to that approach, and with whom I could talk English as opposed to jargon, and we could say, all right, the focus is on the person, what's going on here, and we would teach each other. You know, they would say, well, emotionally, what do you think's going on? And I would say, well, physically, doc, what do you think's going on? And, and that was really what, what led to this whole new way of looking at things. So, so the inter interdisciplinary aspect of the work involved, one, standing outside your professional lens and saying what else could be an answer and two, finding ways to talk to people who aren't from your particular discipline without making them feel like you're trying to gain leverage on them. And that's a very important skill for professionals going out there. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Ranch. All right. Now what I'd like to do is ask a question and um, I'll see who would like to address it. Maybe one or two of you could address it. I think one of the things that um, makes interdisciplinary work quite different is that it requires different resources, sort of a different mind frame um, for approaching this work. So would one or two of you like to speak to how you garner the resources that are necessary to be successful in interdisciplinary work? Thank you, Dr. Sabah. Yeah, sure. Uh, simple answer. I know it's difficult with the lack of funding more and more these days. The, the water is drying up. The funds are drying up. But I cannot advocate enough for going to conferences, especially if they're kind of near your discipline but not in your discipline. Uh, for instance, with this Mill Stories project, which is, which is one of many projects I'm involved with at the moment, I'm learning about processes of deindustrialization, political implications, what have you. But there was a conference in Montreal on the impacts of deindustrialization. I went. This isn't my field. I'm not a historian. I'm not a labor historian, etc. Nonetheless, it brought together such a plethora of, of scholars, practitioners, students uh, who are coming out of political science, again, labor history, oral historians, you name it, 
uh, sociology, anthropology, uh, and to look at these similar issues, whether you're in Canada or in Ohio or here in Baltimore. Um, the conferences such as this, where you can learn about other approaches that may not be used on the same project as yours, but nonetheless you pick up on other ideas people are using. I, it's so rewarding. In my own PhD, when I was in England, I was fortunate to be able to go to many European conferences because I could take sleazy jet for 20 bucks and get to you know, Portugal two hours later, which was great, and I did. And I often did on my own dime, which meant I wasn't eating much, but nonetheless. I'm telling you, I mean, going to these conferences, you, you meet wonderful people, but you also network. Mm -hmm. And then later on, you may never know it, you, you come across that person again, and you start to collabor collaborate on a project. And that's how I've met many of my colleagues across the world. I'm not showing off here, but that's, you know, it's a small world I'm in, uh, you know, uh, to, to collaborate with and to feed, you know, uh, uh, give feedback on what approaches you're using in your context, what have you. So just a very, again, very general answer, but I, I cannot advocate enough for becoming a conference bunny, really. That's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else want to speak to that or? I no, Dr. Blaney, well. thank you. Um, so maybe a bit of a similar answer just to kind of reinforce the point. Um, but in my lab meetings, I have one rule. Everyone from my group has to ask at least one question to everyone that presents in our lab meeting. And the goal of that is, first of all, to generate discussion within our meetings, but also to get people comfortable asking questions. And I hope some of you have seen Dr. Rabowski speak are starting to think about that story that he likes to tell about asking questions. I won't give it away. I'll let you hear it from <laughs> him. Um, because it's a good one and it's an important one because when you're going to conferences, you know, oftentimes maybe you see 12, 15 presentations each day and what I would challenge you all to do is don't just take notes on what the presenter is presenting to you, but take notes that kind of are questions that you're thinking about. And especially think about asking those questions, how can I adapt whatever this person's talking about, if it's chicken poop, if it's, you know, healthcare, if it's something else, if it's storytelling. How can I take what they're telling me and adapt it to my research? How can I get ideas of what they're saying and apply them to things that I'm thinking about on my own in a different field, in a completely unrelated field? Because I think if you do that, you start generating your own ideas. And even though you're grad students and you're not you know, PIs and you're not faculty members, you have good ideas, you have strong ideas, and the more you're asking those questions, the more you're building them so that when you're in faculty positions like we are, you can start pulling those back. I've been doing that for the past four years, thinking about ideas that I had back when I was in grad school and pursuing them. As my grad students can tell you, every so often I throw little projects at them. Um, but asking those questions and forcing yourself to ask the questions rather than just take notes, I think is very powerful. And you know, when you're working in an inter interdisciplinary area with collaborators from different fields, you need to be asking those questions and not just passively receiving the information that they're giving you because that allows you to get a synergy where you're kind of combining the best of both fields mm -hmm. to bring something new to the table. Um, so ask those questions and initiate those conversations, especially at conferences or at talks that are slightly outside of your comfort zone, because that's where you're going to find the best inspiration. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I second what you've heard about going to conferences that are sort of progressively outside mm -hmm. of what you, you know. And it, it brings me to an, an observation I've made um, and, and perhaps I can make it more comfortably because I'm not involved in an intensive research environment like my colleagues are, like many of you are. But I'll also quote Dr. Rabowski, who talks about the elegance of the end. At, in graduate school, you tend to be focused and very specific, and, and you should work in a narrower and narrower and deeper and deeper uh, a field because that's where knowledge has gone. When you think of these other ideas, write them down somewhere. Get out of graduate school and then begin to go back to those notes and begin to say, all right, well, how can I make the circle wider? How can I begin to <clears throat> apply those kinds of ideas that I didn't have time to do while I was a doctoral student or even my, my mentor didn't want to hear? Um, but now, where are the connections to be made outside of my field? And the conferences, the, we, we love it when people come up to us and go, I really love your work, I'm working at so-and-so, and we start collaborating. I did that with two graduate students today. It's really exciting to hear what, what's going on. So you have phases of your career. Don't get discouraged by get, having to get out of here and don't sacrifice your skill set in looking at the bigger picture. I think all three of you, those, those I think were very helpful and we'll kind of cycle back to some of them. Um, 
We've been talking a lot about the very positive aspects of interdisciplinarity and the strengths that it brings to your work and how it helps you see, see, see that your work from a different perspective and in new ways, synergy, integration. But there are also many barriers to interdisciplinary work. And I know in the task force, this is something we've spent a great deal of time talking about, looking as we were talking to leaders across campus, what are the barriers that we have within our campus that are kind of keeping people from being able to work across disciplines, being able to collaborate. So would one or two of you like to speak to um, what the barriers may be and possibly some ways that you've addressed those in your own work? I'll speak up real quickly. Okay, thank we, you. We as, a, as, a, as an interdisciplinary degree found that we were not teaching interdisciplinarity in our program. Yeah. Point. So we made a change and we introduced a course in interdisciplinary thinking uh, that is the first course our students take so that they begin to work with that whole concept of how does the, the interdisciplinarity, how does that Boyx Mancia article I had to read yes. relate to what it is that, that I'm learning in, in every class. So I think that some intentionality about that if we really want to encourage interdisciplinarity as, as the part of the DNA of the intellectual experience at UMBC, e each department might do it differently, but I think some sort of, of contact with that and experience with that would make some sense. That's very important, thank you. Anyone else like to speak to that one? Okay, Dr. Blaney, thank you. Um, I think there's two big ones. I think the first one is kind of the jack of all trades but master of none yes. thing. So I mean, before I was talking about how I'm an environmental engineer, but we also do a little bit of toxicology and pharmacology and like probably half a dozen other things. And so sometimes when I'm talking to a toxicologist, you know, it's kind of like that imposter syndrome thing. It's like, well, I do a little bit here, but really I have no idea. You know, I'm just trying to apply it to this one project and figure out how we can kind of build this project and take it a little bit further than we were trying to before. And so just kind of getting over that and having that confidence I'm working on this. I know there's interdisciplinary aspects to this project, and I'm going to figure out those in terms of how I can build my project and how I can further my project mm -hmm. without getting too caught up in like the whole game of you know having a big ego and being shut down by people, you know, and just kind of putting those people aside and saying there's always going to be those egos in the room. I know what I'm doing is good. I know the work that I'm doing is robust, and I'm going to keep doing it and build myself, um, you know, a successful career. And the other is just to initiate those conversations. I mean, we were just talking about conferences, but it doesn't even have to be conferences. Every department on campus probably has a seminar series that goes weekly. Getting out of your lab, getting off of your floor, and getting out of your building is a really easy barrier to overcome, but it's really hard, mm -hmm. right? I've been on campus for four years. I think I've been in most of the buildings, but I couldn't tell you where half of the departments on campus are actually housed. I need to get out of my own building more often. I think grad students is probably even a bigger challenge for you all. Force yourself to go out. Force yourself, you know, if you're in engineering, you get to a chemistry seminar. Force yourself to go to those seminars because you'll start getting those ideas and you can start asking those questions. How can I adopt this research into my own ideas and into my own plans for um, future work? And I think if you do that, you know, you'll be successful and you'll be having those conversations that increase your network and bring more ideas to your table. Thank you, Dr. Blaney. I think that's very helpful because I know in the LLC program, that is something that we have talked about a lot. How do we do interdisciplinary work in a way that makes us, that we feel and look competent, rather than this idea that you know a little bit about this and a little bit about that, but you don't really know much about anything. So it's that balance of breadth and depth, which can be, can be challenging. And so thank you very much for those very specific ideas about getting out of your building, right, and having some new conversations. Um, I would like to ask very quickly if we could address this quickly and then we want to go ahead and move to some questions if people have them. And that is how do you find potential collaborators? Conferences. <laughs> yeah, go to conferences. No, but, uh, yeah, I mean that's been you know, yeah. my go-to obviously, right. we all know now. But um, uh, going to, I mean, you know, at the same time, yes, uh, notoriously on, on university campuses, you know, the silo system, departments are so isolated from each other, insu insular, what have you. Uh, nonetheless, I, I must admit, being here at UMBC for three years, I find it to be, you know, particularly in the humanities, social sciences side of things, I find there to be tremendous support in leaving your department and coming together nice. for various meetings, whether that's right. around the Breaking Ground right. initiative 
here, yeah, uh, this right. public uh, civic engagement initiative here on campus that's doing very well. Um, you know, they're, they're, for instance, there's a group of, of, of scholars, students who are looking at issues in Baltimore. So there's a Baltimore-centric group. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, all sorts of uh, projects coming out of many different departments. Um, you know, so I, I find it I find it to be a really thriving environment here in that I've met so many other uh, potential collaborator, mm -hmm. collaborators who are now my collaborators, I'm very proud to say. so. Oh, wonderful. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. All right. Um, we would like to open the floor now, and Romy will be roaming around <laughs> that, uh, um, with the microphone. Um, so if you could raise your hand if you have a question. I think Dr. Steiner would like to begin. First of all, I want all of us to give that panel a hand because Yay. it's really important work. Um, and I want to add, rather than a question, I want to add a comment to this. Uh, as a person who has lived interdisciplinary his own life, from composite materials to life science and biotech and now cybersecurity, uh, there are a lot of areas that don't always fit into one hat. Uh, and I want to submit to you within this big program that we have at UMBC in cybersecurity, that obviously is a very interdisciplinary uh, activity as well because it takes much more than just computer scientists and electrical engineers to build boxes and write software to keep us all uh, safe in a way that our data don't fall in the wrong hands. You also need to have social scientists and ethicists and, and public policy people who can think about how do you actually disseminate and, and, and get into a form of, of, of cyber hygiene, like washing your hands when there is a um, when is there's an epidemic around in, in, in the flu, for instance. You wash your hands and then half the cases that would appear would not appear. So if we all change our password every month, I haven't either, by the way. Right. You would be better off. But I want to submit and really just recognize a couple of people in, in, in the room because it's, it's interdisciplinary work, it's interdisciplinary collaboration, but it's also international collaboration with colleagues that are uh, from, from abroad. And we are really honored to have five colleagues with us here today from Kyushu University in southern Japan who have joined us for a two-day visit today, and we asked him to just sit in for a little bit. If I could just have you stand up. We have uh, Dr. Okamura here. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Okada. We have Dr. Uh, Mine, Dr. Hizazumi, and Dr. Kazahara. And these are all very distinguished uh, faculty members from Kyushu University. Uh, two of us from UMBC had a chance to visit them in January in Kyushu when they opened their own cybersecurity center, which actually is the first cybersecurity center at an academic institution in Japan. So what a wow. great partnership for us to link with them. I just wanted to introduce them and, and say domo arigato for being with us today. They will leave us in a few more minutes. But it is about interdisciplinary collaboration, about bringing scientists together, not just from uh, different fields, but sometimes from, from other parts of the world. So thank just you very much. But thank you very much for all your very detailed and, and thoughtful comments. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Anyone? I see a hand. There's got to be questions. Yes, there have to be Remember questions. Remember the comments. Yes, this gentleman has questions, questions or comments. <laughs> right. Gormi's coming with a microphone. Thank you. So one challenge that I've run into as I've worked with people in, in different departments of the university, as a researcher as well as an administrator, is that often when there's an interface between two departments, it's not always going to result in things that are publishable in the highest end journals in both disciplines from one project. And sometimes there's some fields which tend to end up in the service of other fields more than the reverse for that same pair of disciplines working together over time through different people, through different partnerships. So whenever I'm working with people and trying to help build bridges, I, I, I recurringly run into those challenges. And I'm curious if you've run into them and how you've handled them if you have. Thanks. That's a terrific question. Thank you. Who would like to address that one? I haven't run into them. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> I mean, maybe a, a related thing. So, I mean, we haven't run into it necessarily with publications, but sometimes, you know, it's something that's definitely at the forefront of our thoughts, you know, depending on where we're submitting proposals to. So, I mean, if I'm submitting a proposal to the NSF Environmental Engineering Program, but there's interdisciplinary aspects to the proposed work, you know, I think what we have to make sure of is that the primary focus, which would be the environmental engineering, has to be strong, it has to be creative, it has to be in innovative and significant. Mm -hmm. If it's not, the proposal is not going to go through. The interdisciplinary aspects, I think, also have to have those same characteristics. Um, 
But at least in, in my field, I think you know, we've published in environmental journals, we've published in pharmaceutical journals in terms of some of the analytical methods, and we haven't run into that. I think everyone in this room is probably craving that interdisciplinary uh, collaboration. That's why you've stuck with us for the last hour and a half. Um, and hopefully you see that in your own research as well. And I think we've, we've seen the same thing in our field. Whether it translates to other fields, I can't comment. But I've seen it between environmental and pharmaceutical because it's not a mix that we see very often. And so it makes it more interesting. And I think people want to read that. And I think people hopefully want to give us money to continue those projects. Thank you, Dr. Blaney. Hello, my name is Natasha Wilson, PhD candidate in biochemical engineering. And <clears throat> my question is, um, what are your opinions on the, I guess, the relationship or the importance of teaching in the area of interdisciplinary, uh, in di interdisciplinary areas? Um, should there be a shift towards um, maybe students at undergrad levels getting more uh, into interdisciplinary courses in, in their discipline, or should disciplines in general just become more interdisciplinary and then offer tracks that are as such? Um, so just your opinion there. That's a very helpful question. Thank you. Dr. Ranch, would you like to address that? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm decidedly biased because of the nature of our school. <clears throat> and in fact, we intentionally built in interdisciplinary thematic, connect, interdisciplinary thematic connections throughout our undergraduate curriculum, for example. Uh, we have made sure that if you're taking a course in policy at, at the 300 level, you're hearing about issues in aging and issues in management because that's the real world of, of 360 degrees that, that you're going to be working in. Uh, we're doing it on the graduate level as well. It's difficult. It takes stewardship for somebody to do it. <clears throat> but to the, what I think is the implicit point in your question, somebody has to care that that happens. And somebody has to see it as the, I think, advantageous position for, for what the program is that sets them apart from other programs elsewhere. Right. Right. I'll just add, more seven, than eight. interdisciplinarity, which in a way is very innate to applied work, is the applied, is the idea mm -hmm. of bringing students off campus mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. meet with real people, whether it's a qualitative research study where they're interviewing. Uh, 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 Right now I'm teaching students um, about the changes that are undergoing in the Greek town neighborhood in East Baltimore. And so we're on the streets, we're out there, we're learning. It's not just a Greek neighborhood. There are other wonderful cultures that are newer residents, et cetera. So there are all these transitions. And through qualitative ethnographic research, we're learning about that. That, to me, is what is very important, and there should be more of that for students. This idea of, you know, again, civic engagement, the Breaking Ground Initiative, right. but, but, you know, having them relate what we're learning in the classroom to real life outside uh, is really number one, I think, and we should have more and more of that. I think there's um, a little bit of a challenge in the sciences and engineering in this regard, mm. but I think it can be overcome. I think, you know, just like my answer to Don's question, I think the core has to be strong. And so if you're in a science and engineering program, those fundamental principles, you know, your chemistry, your biology, your physics, has to be strong because that's really building your basis for then extending that body of knowledge to other problems and applications. But I think those applications and those other problems, there can be more interdisciplinary character to them where you're actually applying your fundamentals in new and creative ways rather than just kind of going through the same like distillation columns and things like that that chemical engineers always do. How can we be more active in terms of generating new, creative, innovative teaching materials to kind of bring in that interdisciplinarity um, character to science and engineering. Absolutely. I'll just also add very quickly, why is it important to get them off campus? And I don't want to just end there. What I've found over these past three years of, of you know, having students again work with steel workers, learn about their history and, and, and significance of the steel mill, Greek town residents, mm. what I'm learning is that it helps to build compassion within the students, whether they care about nice. Greek town or not. Again, they, they, they're out in the streets and looking at social issues they can relate more but also empathize more which is important no matter again what they're looking at and also they they're starting to or they can uh, many students uh realize that it's more about it, it's it's less about getting an a in the class and it's they're, they're they're starting to realize what they do in these classes is about giving back to the community 
uh, identifying so, uh, community needs, whether it was the steel workers, and helping to give back. It's above and beyond the egotistical, individualistic idea of I need to get an A in this class, which is wonderful to build with students. So, Oh, that's an incredibly important point. Thank you. Um, Romy, I believe we had a question at the front table. Okay, that will be our last question. Yes, thank you. Hi, I'm Sarah Hansen. I'm a master's student in biological sciences, and I'm also um, an officer in the Graduate Association of Biological Sciences. And I happen to know that a lot of our bio biology graduate students are really interested in forming these interdisciplinary collaborations, not just um, with other biology labs, but even beyond that. Um, unfortunately, the culture of our department is not necessarily so encouraging of that. Um, so I was just wondering, particularly Dr. Ranch, um, if maybe we could talk and get some information about what the content of that course that really encourages interdisciplinarity. We have a grad seminar that all of our students have to take in their first year, and it would be wonderful to get some of that um, content just to really start to change that culture and encourage those kinds of beyond biology um, collaborations. So I'd, I'd be happy to share with you, and I can give you a quick summary. We take a case, one of our faculty runs a continuing care retirement community and he brings a problem and he says, I have this opportunity, here are the threats, here are the challenges, here's the money, what should I do? And then Steve McAlpin comes in and says, here's how you go through this. So the, the, the architecture of the course is absolutely transferable, I think, uh, and our faculty member may get a great idea that will make him money. It's always motivating too. Mm, yeah, right. Thank you very much and thank you for the questions. I just want to do a very sort of brief summary of what I've been hearing um, just to sort of drive home I think some of these most important points and that is you know one of the things I'm hearing is that interdisciplinary work is by nature question driven. So you sort of have this question sometimes addressing a social issue very often the case with maybe an applied aspect and that you decide sort of which tools to bring based on what that question is and what's needed in order to address it. Um, so I think that's important. And I think um, what Dr. Stefano was saying was really important. So oftentimes that, that question is around a social issue. And it really troubles this oversimplification, which allows us to see the complexity and nuance of what's going on in these layers and layers beneath the question that we have. And I think that's one of the strengths of interdisciplinary work, and I certainly heard that here today. And it tends to have this sort of applied social aspect. Um, I, I don't know that that's always the case, but for most of the people I know who consider themselves to be interdisciplinarians, I think that is the case. And I also, Dr. Stefano, really loved what you said about how this gets us, one, out of the silos, as Dr. Glendy was talking about, and getting us to walk across the campus and get out of our buildings. But in addition to that, this creation of empathy and really deep understanding. And I think um, one of the challenges I, I think for interdisciplinary work is learning how to listen very carefully and actively in order to hear all of those complexities and nuances that are going on. Um, and then as far as recommendations for our graduate students, I think we've really already addressed that question. One, they need to go to conferences <laughs> and go to conferences in these sort of larger concentric circles away from whatever your, your initial focus is, things that connect in, in ways where you can get some different perspectives and possibly meet some potential collaborators. And I think that all of you have addressed this as well, just the, especially Dr. Blaney, the idea of asking really good questions, which of course is one of the main things that we learn in graduate school, is how to ask a good question. It seems like such a simple task, but it's a very much a skill building. Um, it's certainly one of the most, things that we spend most of our time trying to do is how do you ask a really good question? And then how do you actively listen to what those answers may be? Uh, is there anything else that you would like to add to things that you would want graduate students to know about interdisciplinary work? Maybe just take um, 30 seconds each if you have anything that you'd like to share in addition to asking good questions and going to conferences. Sure. Maybe I'll just build on that, that final point. You know, one of the things I said earlier is, you know, if you go to a conference, maybe you see 12 presentations 
um, in the course of one day. Mm -hmm. And if you're presenting, you know, probably you have about 15, maybe 20 minutes to actually talk about your topic. But if you're sitting in that room all day and for every speaker you're asking a question, you know, you have much more than 15 or 20 minutes to make sure that everyone else in the room knows who you are. And you probably have a bigger opportunity to have an impact on people looking and saying, who is that student back there that keeps asking these really tough questions to all the speakers? And so you don't just have the 15, 20 minutes. You actually have an opportunity at every seminar that you go to, to people, for people to leave and know your name and know who you are. And I think that's one of the things that I would add to my earlier comments about asking you. questions. You grow your opportunity to increase your own professional network um, and make sure that people know who you are, which is the whole point of grad school and going to conferences. Thank you, Dr. Blaney. Dr. Sivana. I'll just add that it's a labor of love. And obviously, those of you who are here and are interested in expanding your, your disciplinary scope and, and collaborating with others, you're on the right track. Obviously, you care. You're inquisitive, you're smart, and you know that it's worthwhile. But it is a lot of extra work, a lot of coordination. It's challenging. But um, again, it's worthwhile. It's really what I'll leave you with. Thank you. So I'm going to predict that the future will have more of interdisciplinary <laughs> collaboration than less because I've seen it in my own career. Uh, I was in a field called developmental psycholinguistics back in 1966. Um, it was a mashup of two fields. It's become neurolinguistics. It's become cognitive neuroscience. It just keeps differentiating. And, and <clears throat> knowledge, I think, like society, just keeps evolving. <clears throat> and the more we see how it answers the important questions, this is to the idea of social relevance, it becomes a very empowering kind of thing. So mm -hmm. I think if you can think as an interdisciplinary thinker, you actually have a great career trajectory. Doesn't mean you'll turn your diploma to the wall when you get out of here, <clears throat> but it means that you'll be able to bring a very strong voice to answering questions in a much bigger way and a much more all-encompassing way. Yeah, that holistic aspect. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Ranch, Dr. Stefano, and Dr. Blaney. Thank you so much. We really appreciate this. If we could give everybody a big hand. Thank you very much for listening, and we hope you enjoy the second half of the research conference and some, um, hear some other new ideas and ask good questions. <laughs> Thank you.